Thank you so much, Vijay. Thank you for those really, really kind words. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so basically, today I'm going to be talking about the work for the past six years on trying to efficiently analyze molecular dynamics simulations to be able to predict mutation effects in proteins. And what happens to these simulations when you basically uh, understand, try to understand the dynamics of one system, and then what happens to these systems when you change the underlying sequence, or you change coordination, or you change something else, and, uh, and what kind of predictions can we make from these simulations that might be testable by experiments. And so the general idea is going to be I'm going to talk about two kinases that I've sort of focused on for the past couple of years, and they're going to be the brute and tyrosine kinase, and then a couple of kinases from the Sark family of kinases. And then what I'm going to then go is change directions to be able to sort of be able to show you exactly what we learned from these previous simulations that allow us to design new algorithms to be able to run these, the next set of simulations more efficiently. And so the latter half will be more algorithmic design, and the first half is going to be more results. Okay, so before I can do that, I think it's good to sort of get everybody up to speed and talk about what exactly are molecular simulations. And so molecular simulations are basically a method for studying large-scale protein motion, where you might think about how does a protein fold or unfold? How does a drug bind to its target? Or maybe how does an inactive state of a protein go to its active state? And what you do is basically given a physics model of your universe, in this case it's mostly an additive force field, a starting structure, which might be, for example, the drug unbound and the protein itself, or maybe the unfolded chain of some protein that you're interested in, Newtonian mechanics, a simulation engine, and GPUs to be able to integrate Newtonian equations of motion, you're able to basically sample how the protein will go through its motion and how it will be able to, and how it will sort of fold and unfold over time. And so this is sort of like run of the mill, basically how pretty much everybody in the world might run molecular simulations. But folding at home is slightly different because what we have is all of our GPUs are actually distributed worldwide in people's computers. And so what happens is somebody in New Zealand and Australia might wake up and they connect to our servers on the West Coast and we send them our data and then they run those simulations locally and then they come back to us and then somebody in South America, oh, they will wake up in a couple of seconds, there we go, they wake up and then they connect to us and then we send them the data and then they run those simulations. And so basically what I'm trying to say is that while I'm talking about these singular examples, we have thousands of donors worldwide. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to get to petaflop scales or tens of petaflop scales and allows us to access simulation time scales and systems that are not easily accessible to other labs. And so this was actually, uh, I think, 24 hours worth of donor donors sort of connecting and disconnecting from our servers or for one of my kinase projects. And basically, by the end, my one simulation had seen more parts of the world than I'll probably ever be able to, which is not, anyways. <laughs> So we run these, and so why do we run these MD simulations? Well, the whole idea is we want to have a computational microscope to be able to understand our protein of interest. And so what we want to be able to do is understand what are the states or the structures that we might find interesting. What does the folded state look like? What does the unfolded state look like? How, what does the drug bound state look like? What does the active state look like? And so on and so forth. We're also curious about, is one more stable than, than the other? That's thermodynamics or populations. And so you want to know, is the, is the folded state the most stable in the ensemble, or is it maybe the drug-bound state, or maybe uh, it's the active state relative to the inactive state? You're curious about the kinetics, and what that does, how quickly do you get from one part of the ensemble to the other? How quickly does the drug bind? How quickly does it unbind? How quickly do you fold? How quickly do you unfold? And what pathways does it take? Is it the same for all of these systems, or is it different every single time? And does that lead to different experimental observables? We're also curious about are the, if you make a mutation to the system, because all around us, biology is full of mutations, what happens to these simulations? Does the thermodynamics change? Do the population shift around? Does it change the kinetics? Maybe it goes from a mi microsecond time scale process to a millisecond, or maybe it goes to a nanosecond. And being able to sort of predict those is all dependent on having an accurate enough force field or physics model and then being able to sample from this physics model for long enough. And so basically every word in this slide is somebody's thesis work, and so I've sort of only focused on being able to tell the differences between mutations and sampling. And so, I mean, why, like what's the problem here? Why can't we just run these simulations? And the problem is that these simulations, after months of work, they get very big, very, very fast. 
where any single simulation, because they were limited by a two femtosecond time step, after months of simulation and a few million data points only is a few microseconds of actual human time. But now you have three terabytes of data to go through. But what we have run is maybe 20 of these systems over the last six years, and we have 100 terabytes of data, or hundreds of terabytes of data. And so how do you begin to even analyze these kinds of data sets? There's like a very natural argument to be made that we need to do some kind of machine learning here to be able to make simple models. And so if I had to sort of summarize my entire PhD in one slide, uh, it comes down to this. Given sets of simulations, can we build a model for what, for example, the active state might look like for this kinase relative to synactive state? What, is it more or less stable than a synactive state? How quickly do you get from the inactive state to the active state? Or it might be the drug-bound state to the unbound state, and so on and so forth. And, and, what, and so more importantly, if you make a mutation to the system, are there statistically significant differences between these ensembles? Is there a reason for why that difference exists? And more importantly, can we make this entire process more efficient over time via some combination of machine learning and accelerated sampling? And so this is known as sort of the mutant problem in computational biology or biophysics. And I have to write a few papers to kind of fix that. Uh, <laughs> all right. So before I go into my results, I think there's one other piece of information that you will need, which is sort of the bread and butter of how we analyze simulations within the Pandey lab, which is known as Markov state models. And so Markov models are, or MSMs, are basically kinetic master equations that you parameterize with MD simulations. So you can sort of think about, let's say, the drug, or like the folded state and the network of unfolded states and all the transitions that connect them. And you'll have is short trajectories that go from one state to the other and back and forth and so on and so forth, and you build up a full matrix over time. And so you might start these simulations in some South Africa, and these simulations might be running somewhere uh, on the East Coast, and these might be somewhere else, and all that data comes back to us, and we basically populate a very large matrix of these transitions. Once we have that matrix, you basically know everything about the system you need. What you can get is the free energies, the kinetics, the structures, and the pathways, all that information is sort of encoded in this one particular kinetic master equation. The nice thing is, though, it can actually handle a relatively long time scales, it can do a lot of interesting things, and so there's like maybe 20 years of work now that has gone into it. And so how does it work? Well, typically you start by running thousands of these short simulations. And what they go and what you do is we have to now, because it's like a high dimensional system, we reduce the dimensionality by using an algorithm called TICA. So TICA is basically a reaction coordinate finding me mechanism in Markov state models. What it happens is given, let's say, some sampling in the unfolded state and the folded state, Tekka will tell you sort of a one-dimensional projection that goes from the unfolded state to the folded state. And what it does is it tries to basically maximize the autocorrelation function. But the whole idea is, as soon as I say Tekka or Tex, you should think of reaction coordinates. Um, and so going back to this idea of like, we can do machine learning on these systems, but you have to do these carefully. You can't just take an algorithm for machine learning and apply it willy-nilly and hope for the best. For example, in these kinds of systems, PCA actually often will fail, which is something that is done a lot in other ML algorithms. But we basically had to design an algorithm with simulations in mind to be able to find these kinds of coordinates for us. And so now what we have is basically a subspace out of thousands and thousands of possible coordinates. And we do some kind of, we basically do a Warnight tessellation, which is a fancy way of saying clustering. And what you can do is now you basically, for example, what you might have done is we started 50 tra trajectories here and 10 go here. And so now that part of the particular matrix would be 0.8 for staying in and 0.2 going out. And you build up this entire matrix over time. And once you have this matrix, you can do an eigen decomposition and you can look at it in different ways. And that gets you everything you need to know about this particular system for the time scale that you have simulated. Uh, this never really works the first time. Uh, so you have to do it in an iterative fashion. It's like a, it sort of has to be done in that way. Um, so I've done a lot of Markov modeling on protein kinases. And in particular, I focused a lot on the tyrosine kinase part of the kino, uh, which is right here. And there's like 500 other kinases. And they all sort of share this particular catalytic domain, which is what I've mostly worked on. There's a beta sheet heavy end lobe. There's a alpha helical C lobe. 
And then there are like a couple of important bits. There's an orange bit right here, which is called the catalytic helix, and then there's a red bit, which is known as the activation loop. So at the start of this red bit, there's a DFG motif, and that stands for the, the aspartate, the phenylalanine, and the glycine residues that make up the DFG uh, motif. And then the ATP spines right next to the DFG motif. And so um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the orange bit and the red bit. So anytime I sort of, if you think about this, just think of these particular regions as being important. And what happens in these kinases is they basically transfer ATP's gamma phosphate group to some downstream particular other kinase or other peptides, and this they, they trigger signaling cascades. And those signaling cascades uh, are, and so these are kinases are very much involved in a lot of different uh, critical pathways, and which makes them very important targets, uh, pharmaceutical targets for a lot of different cancers. And, uh, and so the tyrosine kinases are involved in uh, breast cancer and leukemia and so on and so forth. And so we basically what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to selectively inhibit certain kinases, for example. Now, we already know a lot about different kinases. For example, in the active state across different kinases, it's known that this orange bit sort of rotates towards the core of the protein. And then there's a DFG in inactive state where the orange bit rotates out, and then the DFG is still pointing towards the ATP binding site. And then there's a secondary inactive state which rotates around 180 degrees. Um, and so you might be curious is, do all these states exist in all kinases? Uh, what's the sequence dependence of the populations of each of these states? What are the kinetics of getting from one state to the other uh, for each sequence? And that's like, sort of like a systematic way to perturb the effects of mutations in, this, in, this, in these kinds of things. And so uh, what I wanted to do was sort of answer this within the context of root and tyrosine kinase. And this is a project that we ran in collaboration with uh, Pfizer, and Danny is like the second author on that paper. And what, one of the first things we were able to show was that basically there are a lot of states in these kinases that are relatively unexplored that might be very critical for drug discovery, for example. And so what Heinrich Mobitz uh, a couple of years ago basically took every kinase structure that has ever been crystallized up until 2015, and he sort of he characterized them into these important metastable states that he thought were important for drug discovery. And what you're able to show, starting from the white dots, is that you can base, you can recover the entire landscape for, for for one BTK kinase, even though you never have seen these particular states for BTK. And what that means is there is a kinome-wide conformational plasticity for this one kinase that uh, is sort of captured by other kinases. And you can, again, go in and sort of look at our intermediate states that we see in our simulations. And you see a very high correlation between what we see as being an MD versus what, we, uh, versus what has been crystallized via, for, in other kinases across other sequences. But the whole point is not only do you want to get these states, you want to get their relative free energies. You want to get their populations, for example. And what you're able to show in this system was that the active state connects to the DFG in inactive state and the DFG out state via T-like topology, where there's a metastable intermediate that connects all of them. And that the active state is above both of the inactive states, and then the DFG out state is relatively unpopulated. And so I, I wanted to talk about mutations. And so one of the mutations that has been sort of proposed for a lot of these kinases is protonation effects, based on some work that was done a couple of years ago. And so we were curious about this as well. And so we basically took our starting structures and we changed one proton. We protonated the aspartate of the DFG to be a pronated aspartate. And we reran the same set of simulations for the same set of time. And about 800 or so microseconds later, what we ended up was showing that the protonation stabilizes the DFG out state by at least a couple of kcals. Um, the only, and so, so then we looked into this data a bit further, and we were able to show was that this effect is coming mostly from stabilizing of the forward transition where the forward transition used to be multi-millisecond, but then goes down to a few hundred microseconds. And that leads to a population increase, which was basically unobserved in our ensemble, maybe a percent or so, to something that's closer to 20 or 10% of the ensemble. And so this is great. So we now have an idea about the thermodynamics. We have an idea about the kinetics. We know maybe what happens to this ensemble when you make a mutation, which is a protonation, which is a simple change. But the question becomes, OK, how do you get from here to here? What are the intermediate states? Um, and so you can look at uh, trajectories. 
And so, but again, this is starting in the active state where the orange bit is rotated towards the core of the protein. And the first thing that's going to happen is this dihedral around the DHG changes, and then it naturally rotates out. And so now it's technically catalytically inactive. Um, so you got excited when you saw this, and you're like, all right, let's start a lot of simulations here, so more simulations there, and you, we're like, okay, let's see what happens after it goes from here. And so we ran those simulations too, and you're able to sort of construct this entire y-axis. And what happens is, in starting the active state, the orange bit is in, then eventually the DHG dihedral changes, and the orange bit rotates out, and then starting from there, eventually the red bit uh, sort of folds into this double helical state. And that's the most stable state within an ensemble. But again, like I said, there's like a T that connects these things, so we want to understand the x-axis as well. And so that's sort of the DFG transition. So starting in the DFG out state, the first thing you'll notice that will happen is that the red bit is sort of going to prop the entire kinase open. But then it's going to get stuck because there are a couple of residues that block its path. There's a phenyl here and a methionine there. Eventually this phenyl is going to move, and then the DFG phenyl is going to move, but then it gets stuck still because the methionine is in the way, and then the methionine moves, and then eventually the aspartate sort of shifts around. And so this, for this 180 degree dihedral change required about, let's see, 35 to no, 70 or so GPUs running pretty much every single day for months on end, and you're only able to see a few of these transitions. And that's because for this one transition to happen, you need to have a lot of things happen simultaneously. And what that means is that things are not as simple as just looking at one particular difference in these simulations. And again, what we were able to do was make a simple model as to how, well, how we think the DFG changes. And what happens is, in this DFG out state, the first thing that's going to happen is the phenyl 5 and 7 moves out. So this goes from red to white to blue. So you can sort of follow that x-axis. And then it becomes this clam-like state where the phenyl and the aspartate are moved, basically pointing in the same direction. But then it has to wait for this methionine to move out of the way. And then eventually, you have this full transition. And so that allows you to traverse the x-axis in these simulations. And so the take home message here is that there's a lot of plasticity in these kinase states that we have never seen, but once you run these simulations to a few milliseconds, you're able to uh, get them. There's the multiple inactivation pathways, and you can sort of combine all those pathways into one single model, and then you can make a mutation to that model and have the MSM be able to tell you that the protonation is affecting the DFG transition in this case. Um, the only thing is it just requires running the second largest kinase simulations that have ever been done. Um, just, it's, just, it's, it's just a large amount of compute. OK, so that was like the first short story. So let me talk about the next short story, which is the Sark family. And so the Sark was like the first kinase that was run in our group. So Dwakar Shukla, who's now a professor at Illinois, he ran this starting from the active state and active state and sort of connected them and saw a couple of interesting intermediate states that might have been important for drug discovery and so on and so forth. And I was curious, do we get the same model when we change the sequence? Um, and I was, I thought I would be very systematic, so I looked at group A of these kinases uh, in this particular tree, and I was like, all right, I'm going to pick Finn, or it got picked for me, but either way. And we only had access to maybe two structures at the time. And so after a little bit of simulation, we were able to sort of map out, again, the entire activation pathway. And again, you're going to see something very similar happen, but now it's going in reverse. What's going to happen is that the orange bit, I'm sorry, the red bit is going to first unfold, and then this dihedral is going to change, and then the orange bit is eventually going to rotate in. And so we're seeing very similar things across these different tyrosine kinases, where you're sort of seeing, OK, this orange bit moves out, this orange bit moves in, the red bit moves in, red bit moves out, the DFG probably does something too. And so you might want to start thinking, why are you running all these simulations? Like, why can't you do something a bit better? Um, and so I was like, well, I should be sure about this. And so I basically ran every single kinase in this tree, um, except for YRK, because I think we had the wrong sequence uh, at the time. Uh, like ultimately, we collected the largest kinase simulation data set, I believe. And so this total amount of aggregate sampling was closer to six milliseconds, and that is like, not that much actual time, but it required, I think, four years of simulations. <laughs> uh, and long story short, uh, this is what somebody at BPS told me was a really nice negative result. <laughs> uh, 
what happened was basically after all these simulations, we made all these models and they are statistically insignificant from one another. Where, let me walk you through these figures where every color on the x-axis in both these plots is a different kinase. The y-axis on the left is the population and they're all within 10 to 25 to 30 percent. And that's less than half a kcal. And that difference from modern forcible perspective is basically zero. Um, and so this orange bit in is about 20% populated across all these seven sequences. And more importantly, getting from this active state to this inactive state and back, the time scales are all the same as well. Where activation takes on the order of hundreds of microseconds to milliseconds, closer to the millisecond time scale, and deactivation is closer to the 10 to the 100 microsecond time scale. And what this is saying is basically, once you get to a high enough sequence identity, at least with modern force fields and simulations, we can't tell them apart. The only thing we can say across this entire group is that this active state is slightly more, uh, un slightly more unstable than the inactive state by about a kcal, and that the time scales uh, for going uh, this way are slightly faster than going coming back the other way. And, and so this was sort of like a problem. Well, so we were like, there's a, some nice things here. We were able to sort of say, okay, we can say systematically that Finn is doing similar things to Sark, and we can say that for the rest of the family too, and that, and that there are small differences between these particular sets of sequences. Um, and we had to do some, and, but then the question becomes, where does this stop? Because this is clearly madness if you think about it. Where, let's say you have 500 kinases, and you have two protonation states, and maybe a few, a few phosphorylation states, and maybe a few hundred mutations, because each one of these kinases has hundreds of known mutations in, that have been registered across different like, genome data, for example, and sequencing data. And what you're looking at is basically hundreds of thousands to millions of simulations. And if you can't accelerate each one of these box plots, you are never going to be able to be able to use these in practice. And the question becomes, how do you accelerate molecular simulations? And that's sort of what I've been very much focused on for the last couple two years or so now. Um, so before I can do that, I have to give you about 40 years of enhanced sampling literature in one slide. I'm really, really sorry about this, but basically, what basically, if you know interesting reaction coordinates or collective variables or x-axis for your system, you can push away from things that you have already seen to things, for example, that you have not seen, as we will eventually discover this basin right here. And then it will add energy to the system to things that it's already seen, and then it will sort of push out again. And there are many ways to add this energy. This is called something called metadynamics, which is actually confirmation flooding. Um, uh, you can use umbrella sampling. You can use uh, crystal adaptive icing pores. There's, there's many, many ways of doing this energy adding. But all these methods have this one critical element. It's how do you pick this reaction coordinate? How do you pick this collective variable or this x-axis? And how do you describe a kinase? And this is not a simple problem, I would argue. There's thousands and tens of thousands of these things to pick from. Um, it could be maybe it's the distance between these two residues. Maybe it's the distance between these two residues. Maybe it's this angle that connects them. Um, maybe it's something pathological. Maybe it's the square root of this distance multiplied by the angle plus the cube root of the, these two distances. That's a perfectly legitimate collective variable or reaction coordinate. It's just that we cannot intuit it. As soon as you get above a few dimensional spaces, our ability to sort of pick these collective variables just fails. And so I thought about this problem, and I said, okay, well, what if you run these simulations for long enough that you're able to see something interesting? And can you then design algorithms that will learn from these current simulation data sets in an optimal manner to modify the next simulation uh, to be able to see those particular changes much more efficiently, or those dynamics much more efficiently? And what we basically argued was that you're already doing this when you build MSMs in Pika. That the reaction coordinate scheme that we use for building our mock up state models, uh, when you run it in reverse, gives you the collective variables that you sort of need to accelerate to be able to see those processes happening many, many, many times. And this was initially inspired by okay, we need to be able to, instead of taking years, maybe we should get it down to months at least. And so you were like, okay, can we converge these simulations faster? And the whole point was, let's say you run these for long enough that you maybe a day on a GPU that you see a few slow transitions. What you can then do is run this MSM and tick analysis and then combine that with some accelerated sampling schemes like metadynamics or um, ABF and so on and so forth 
to be able to see the same process happen hundreds of times, but now in a few hours on a GPU. And for example, if you're interested in maybe computing the populations of these regions, which might be, say, some dihedral change, um, this initially was impossible. It's like very difficult because there's like very few sparse transitions that connect them. But now you're able to get much better free energy estimates or the population estimates that are shown by this red curve right here. And then obviously, like you can start with the cyan curve and get an idea about this. But then, for example, if you take this black curve and then extend it out to 10 days, you'll sort of get a gold curve, which asymptotically is basically approaching what we have, which took three hours. And so we have gone down to is maybe requiring 10 days of sampling or 20 days of sampling down to a day in maybe two hours. So you're getting a little bit better. But the cool thing is that once you start playing in this interface of Markov models and enhanced sampling and machine learning, you sort of have a lot of tricks that you can borrow from each field and put into all of them uh, and put into one particular simulation where you can use something called bias exchange, which allows you to go up to multiple coordinates that are all from the MSM. So you might be interested in both the folding of a system and a drug binding to it. And those will form two coordinates that you simultaneously accelerate. Or you might be, uh, you might, and that actually will help the sampling a lot. Or you might actually be able to use something from, from machine learning, which is known as the kernel trick. And so I said before that maybe your collective variable or your action coordinate or x-axis is the square root of a distance multiplied by the angle plus something else, uh, the cube root of or some other distance. That's actually just a polynomial kernel. You can literally just plug and play and drop it into our Markov models, and that will allow you to sort of build that particular x-axis based on the current data that you've already seen. And so we were like, okay, if you're going to do nonlinearity, you should just go the full way and just build neural networks. Because we are in Silicon Valley, and everybody's convinced that these are going to save the world, right? I mean, they're amazing. They're amazing. Like, they're amazing universal function approximators. They can do amazing things in, a, in different fields. They can identify cat pictures. They can drive cars. They can play chess. They can find people in photographs. They can, like, identify when you're having under attack or something like that. And so we were like, okay, why can't we just take this high-dimensional object and push it through our neural networks and get something out that is a collective variable? or a reaction coordinate. And so we thought about this, and we basically designed a neural network around this, exactly around this. What we did was we created a variation on a autoencoder, uh, which we, it was just shown in this paper, so it was like four, there are four people on the, in the group that were on this paper. And what we did was we basically uh, took our protein, which is an XT right here, which might be a few hundred dimensions, and then we take an autoencoder, the encoder part of the autoencoder, and compresses it down to one number, then get, that gets decompressed again, and then it tries to predict what the protein is going to be some time tau later. And so it's trying to do is sort of learn a propagator for this particular protein. Um, and then there are a couple of other tricks in this, which is shown in this paper right here, and why we argue that this particular encoder then becomes our collective variable, our x-axis. And we sort of showed in a second paper that, yes, indeed, you can use it in simulations to accelerate dynamics. And so the, the whole point here was, again, to do something very similar as before. But let's say you are doing some simulations, and you run these for a day or two or GPU, and you get a few transitions. But they're like, it's hard to estimate differences between these two if you only have two events, right? And so what you do is you can now basically make a neural network, and then it will sort of or the variational band, variational autoencoder, and then it will sort of accelerate these transitions many, many, many times. And the more transitions you are able to show, the better your population estimates are going to be. Um, to be able to do this, though, for larger systems, you need to be able to teach simulation engines about neural networks. And so the text on the left is basically what a network would look like when it's or looks like when it's sort of written out as a series of transforms that a simulation engine like OpenMM can understand, and it tracks the folding and unfolding of a protein. And so that simulation on the right was that protein <laughs> being folded, for example. But now in a time scale that is actually computationally manageable. Okay, but there's a problem with this algorithm, and I hope you're able to see this, is that you have to do the same amount of work for every single mutation. This black curve is a day for a small peptide. But for a kinase, it's months of work. And if you have to do that, like it's better to be able to do maybe two months of work than two years of work, 
But still, like a few months of work for every single mutation you might be interested in is like a big problem. And so how do you get around this problem of having to do this expensive simulation every single time? And so the idea was basically inspired by the transfer learning literature in ML, where what it goes is it does things as follows. So let's say you build some model for identifying cat pictures. And now somebody tells you, I need a model that will identify kittens for me. And you have a sneaking suspicion that the cat model will be highly transferable to the kittens model too. And so what you do is you basically transfer over the, the model itself and then you sort of do a little bit of retraining with limited data and that gets you a close approximation to the kittens model without having to do a lot of expensive data collection within the kittens space. And I was like, okay, we can sort of think of analogously in, in, like in how I do MD research is how I look at previous work. I look at what other people have thought about in these systems, about how they think about reaction coordinates, about how they think about homology modeling and so on and so forth. And what you can do is sort of uh, put all that into a single framework where what we, can, what we can use are all the previous simulations that have been run for all related systems to transfer over their reaction coordinates to our new mutation of interest. And what that comes down to is basically doing a sequence alignment to figure out where all the residues are in each particular sequence. And then their combination of some kind, which can be linear or nonlinear or something, is learned from one simulation data set and then transferred over to all the other ones. The core assumption that you're making, obviously, is that they all sort of are doing similar things. What you're saying is that this kinase that one drug binds to a kinase, and then the second drug is also going to bind to the same position in the kinase. What you're saying is a protein folds, and then you make a mutation to the protein that also folds to the same state. And that any additional slow mode that you introduce are fast on this time scale of the simulation. And so we were like, okay, you should test this out. And so the first mutation that we thought about was, what happens when you change the physics model? Like that's a mutation, it's like a force field is like a choice that we make at the start of every simulation where you pick, we are going to run it in charm or amber or something like that. And we're curious about, okay, what happens to these populations, for example, when you change the underlying physics? And we basically ran this for like a day and then we sort of re-ran this with our accelerated sampling scheme for a couple of hours, but we ran it in three simulation, three different physics models. And then we got a gold star data set which was, again, somebody actually went through and did the 20 days on a GPU calculation for us. And we were able to show was that basically you get exactly the same populations when, but now instead of 20 days, we're down to maybe two to three hours. And more importantly, we only have to do this one day initially. And so one day plus 10 hours gets you equivalent to something like 60 days. So we're getting better. Um, but this is, but again, the whole point is it shouldn't work for just small systems. You should be able to make mutations for that folding protein and this is a GTT mutant, we ensure that it actually does fold to its right topology first. And then this mutation was actually picked because um, Linda Larson and Cam et al. actually have done this work where they show that this particular GTT mutation uh, actually increases the folding rate and destabilizes the unfolded state. And that's exactly what we see too. Where once you make this GTT mutation on the FIP, which is the green, which is the wild type simulation that we learned the folding coordinate from, you can sort of, you sort of destabilize the unfolded state and slightly stabilize the folded state. But now instead of requiring 600 microseconds, which is months and months and months on tens of GPUs, this is, that y-axis is maybe three or four days on 20 GPUs. And that's, it's, it's getting better. But there's still a problem with these simulations. And the problem is that, well, what if this just doesn't exist? Like the first algorithm I described was, well, we're running these simulations. What we can do is um, enhance maybe, like we, we have some simulations for our system of interest and we can learn from the reaction coordinates from it and be able to converge those simulations. The second algorithm was, well, maybe somebody has run something related and we can cannibalize their data to help us. But there's a problem where maybe you're working on a system that nobody has simulated before or maybe doesn't care about how do you sort of generate this particular initial collective variable? How do you get that x-axis to be able to drop those energies to be able to do that? And this is, and sort of in two dimensions, this problem comes down to, let's say you have a folded state and an unfolded state. How do you pick some direction to go in? And again, these are two dimensions, but you have to sort of 
think that there are like thousands and thousands of these numbers to pick from. And I thought about this and I was like, well, what if it was cats and dogs? Again, because supervised machine learning has solved this problem for us. What they've done is, they ha there's a series of algorithms that'll identify cat pictures from dog pictures. And what they all do is sort of draw a hyperplane between an area that is the cat area in this high dimensional space and an area that's the dog area in this high dimensional space. And my argument was, well, the distance to that particular hyperplane is the collective variable. It's the x-axis that we should be going back and forth between. Where what you can do is sort of have the folded state and the unfolded state, and then learn this hyperdimensional, high dimensional boundary, and then the distance to that boundary basically becomes the collective variable. And then so when you accelerate the dynamics along it, you're able to fold it and unfold it in time scales that are now much more amenable to computation or to everyday simulations. Okay, but the, and so this was like recently, uh, it's currently under review, but this is basically, general idea was uh, to train any kind of supervised machine learning algorithm to be able to do this for us. But the problem, and, and so I have a qualm against a lot of accelerated sampling literature because it doesn't scale to kinases, and they all sort of fail in higher dimensions. And so the question is, will this work on a kinase? And this comes down to, can I predict the change in that proton without having to do 800 microseconds or six months of simulation. And to do that, I basically went through the literature and I've collected all the different like, papers that people have published across different tyrosine and kinases. And then I look and basically identify what everybody likes and then realize that somebody has already done it for us, where people are actually interested in common commonalities between kinases, so they've done this sequence alignment for us. And we combine this now with all of our tens of milliseconds of simulation data and our collective variable finding algorithms. And what now happens is that for every related kinase sequence, we can go through our data set and now build these new collective variables for anybody that might want to simulate, for example, a DFG transition or the C helix transition or these large scale transitions in the orange bit and the red bit. And that what that allows you to do, for example, is simulate the DFG transition in ABLE, which goes through a different pathway than the ones that we've already seen, even though we have never run this simulation before. And what you're doing is basically accelerating the direction in phase space where to go in, um, and, that, and then sort of the MD engine corrects the rest. But you're not only doing this one time, you're doing this many, many, many times, so that we can get accurate statistics on whether the DFG outstate is actually accessible in these simulations. What are the relative populations of that DFG outstate in this particular kinase sequence? Is it more or less than one kinase or another? And whether we can use that for drug discovery, for example, or whether we can use that to build um, a new drug that might target this state versus that state. Maybe that state is only accessible in one kinase, and that might allow you to have a better selective drug. Or you might think about maybe, uh, uh, like there are a lot of like these questions that you start to answer once you have these collective variables that are so automatically generated. And so it's an interesting question that you have to think about as to where you might be able to go next. And I would argue that some of the more interesting problems you can tackle are in the past, where you can go down the phylogenetic tree and sort of consider where does a particular behavior emerge for a particular sequence? Where does the DFG outstate become accessible in the kinase? Where does the DFG instate become accessible? Are the active states and the populations the same in, across, if you go back 100 million years, or are they changing? Um, and so, uh, are the thermodynamics the same, the kinetics the same, and so on and so forth. We can also start to maybe systematically look at those million simulations that I was talking about, but now in a time scale that's actually accessible uh, for, our, for us in our lifetimes. And think about, okay, what's the difference between the Sark family and the Tech family right here? What's the difference between the HER2 family and something on the tar receptor tires and kinases? And maybe can we use these differences to, uh, to design better drugs that might be only selective for one kinase versus another kinase? What happens to these systems when you make an oncogenic mutation? Because a lot of these kinases, they go haywire in a lot of cancers. For example, one of our projects, the HER2 project, is involved in breast cancer, and there's known mutations from uh, breast cancer patients where having that mutation just increases their, their predisposition to having cancers. And they, and there's, it would be curious to know whether our simulations are able to say exactly why 
what's the, what is the atomic level reasoning because why that kinase is more active or less active. And then, one of, and then like some reach projects you might want to think about is what is the minimal set of simulations needed to, sim to do the entire pathway with some kind of accelerated sampling? Like how many simulations of biased and unbiased MD do we need to be able to say, okay, now we've done these parts and I can connect them the whole via kinetic Monte Carlo scheme. And then obviously you can think about maybe doing some kind of predictive protein design because now let's say you've seen some kind of interesting state and what you want to be able to do is a derivative with respect to the population of that state of the sequence so that you can now stabilize that particular state in a particular sequence over time. And that might get you like more interesting therapeutics and so on and so forth. 